Hey, amen. Come on, let's give God some praise in this place on tonight. At this 7 o'clock hour that the Lord has allowed us to see, we are thankful for God's grace and mercy for allowing us to see a wonderful Wednesday. And we praise God for giving us safe traveling mercy. Those of us who are here in person, able to get here before the rain really struck. And so we're thankful. And those of you who are joining us via the World Wide Web, we bless God for you, whether you're joining us on our website or on our Facebook Live, YouTube page, whatever it is, we want you to know that we indeed are grateful for your presence, even via live stream. We call it the Cyber Sanctuary, the Cyber Sanctuary, uh, because the church is wherever you are, wherever you are, that's where the church is. Uh, and so we want you to know that we're thankful for your presence, even via the stream, uh, and we pray that you may be able, if circumstances allow, to join us on next Wednesday in person. Uh, again, we're thankful for safe traveling mercy, uh, as it appears that we're expecting, uh, I don't know if it's a storm, if it will, but we're definitely expecting some rain as it is raining now, and so as we exit, certainly we want everyone to be safe in their travels. Turn with me to the book of Judges tonight, uh, and as you're doing that, Judges chapter number 7, a very familiar narrative and passage of scripture, uh, one in which if you spent any considerable amount of time in the Lord's church, uh, you will be familiar with. If you haven't, I behoove you to become familiar because it is a very inspiring story uh, within the history of Israel during a period called Judges. Uh, it was a period called Judges, and this is um, a period in which Israel had already entered the promised land uh, but God instructed them that he did not want them to be like everyone else, whereas most other kingdoms, per se, had kings that ruled over them. Uh, the Lord organized a group of people, um, and they were called judges. Some of them were priests. Some of them were just community leaders. Uh, and these individuals were known as the judges of Israel who helped keep order uh, in the Israelite ranks. And so we're going to talk and we're going to reintroduce ourselves to this brother named Gideon tonight. Uh, and uh, as you're turning to Judges chapter number seven, we're starting a new uh, series on Wednesday nights. I told you last week that it was just a post-resurrection week and we dealt with uh we dealt with peter and his love for god and understanding that love requires sacrifice and today i want to introduce to you a new series um titled can you stand the rain it's fitting that it's raining tonight right uh it's a new series i'm starting specifically on wednesdays uh titled can you stand the rain uh, it is a series that is specifically about growth, spiritual growth primarily. I'm led to believe, and I know some of you may agree, that when you begin to grow spiritually in your life, it overflows into every other area of your life. Once you become an individual who is active in growing spiritually, you'll see growth in every other area in your life. I, I, I mean, I mean this, I guarantee it. When you really put an effort and you're active in growing your relationship with God, you'll see prosperity begin to emerge in every other area in your life. Even if you don't ask for it, it just happens by happenstance. It happens by, uh, it, it happens by connection because every other area of your life is connected to your spirituality, every other area of your life begins to blossom and grow as you grow spiritually. And so, but you can't grow without rainy seasons. Amen, church. There can, there can be no growth without rainy seasons. We're in a rain season right now. It's raining every other day in Georgia. But the lawns can't go from brown to green without that rain. The trees can't blossom effectively and the, 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 the flower bushes cannot, f they can't blossom effectively without that rain. 
And so rainy seasons are necessary. This is why we shouldn't always panic or be frustrated when a storm hits our life. If I'm looking at it from a optimistic point of view, I'll recognize that the storm is sent to help me grow in an area that is necessary so that when I get out of the storm, I'm at another level in my life. It's bringing growth. We have to learn how to look at things optimistically. And so consequently, I'm going to be teaching for the next few weeks from Can You Stand the Rain, the sermon series. And tonight we're in the book of Judges. Before I read the scripture tonight, I also want to announce that we're looking at May the 18th. Uh, and I'll try to announce this at the end of our time together. But May the 18th, which is a Saturday, uh, we, we, we're planning a month out. Uh, anyone who has joined this ministry, uh, shout out to all of our new, let's give God praise to our new members, amen, those who have connected with us. Uh, but I want you to know that whether you've connected with us in the past few weeks or month or so, or whether you've connected with us a while ago, we're going to be hosting a new members fellowship. Uh, it's going to be a new members fellowship breakfast on May the 18th. That's a Saturday. We plan to start at 930. Uh, and we're going to roll over from the new members fellowship in which I'll be uh, talking about some things. Pastor Rogers will be dealing with some things. Uh, and then we're going to have lunch. And then during our lunch, we're going to do a little work because we also want to have a ministry interest meeting, a ministry interest meeting. Uh, many of you know that our church is a very young church. And what we're aiming to do in this season is to build out the infrastructure of our church. And so now is the time for us to really begin to launch ministries that are going to be beneficial to particular groups, men's ministry, women's ministry, youth and children, evangelism, discipleship. These are the ministries that help build the church and keep the church undergirded. And so as a consequence, we're going to have a ministry interest meeting uh, around. We're going to start that around 1230 on that Saturday uh, as we move from our new members fellowship to lunch and to and in, right into our ministry interest meeting. So I want you to save the date if you're able. Um, save the date, May the 18th, Saturday, May the 18th. It's going to be a great day in the life of our church as we are looking to build our infrastructure here at House of Hope West Point. Judges chapter number seven, if you will, uh, and we will begin reading. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, uh, and uh, I promise that whatever version you have will suffice. Judges chapter number seven, and um, for, the sake of, um, for the sake of time, I want to read verses one through eight, but we're going to deal with some other verses as well, so Make sure that you leave your Bible open because this is what we're here for, to study the Bible. Amen? 7, 1 through 8, Judges, this is the word of the Lord. The Bible says, so Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Herod, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned. And 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water, and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink, 
and the number of those who lapped putting their hand to their mouth were 300 men. But all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. Then the Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his own place. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and he sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained those 300 men. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Let us pray. God, we say thank you tonight for your grace and mercy that has ushered us throughout this entire day. If it weren't for you, we wouldn't have seen this day. We know we shall never see this day again. And so even for the remainder of this day, we want you to know how grateful we are, how we appreciate the moment that we're situated in. God, you have without question been good to us, even through some trials and tribulations. I can recognize your goodness and your grace. And so for that, God, we want you to know that you deserve all of our praise. That is what we give you tonight particularly as we strive to educate ourselves and to become better disciples, as we strive to grow in our relationship with you. We ask that you would illuminate our minds, help us to be inquisitive, and also help us to see something we may not have seen before in this passage. If there's anyone who may on, be on their way to the house of God, we ask that you give them safe traveling mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so now we discover this brother by the name of Gideon. Now, I kind of started in the middle of the narrative, and this is probably the most popular position within this narrative about Gideon and his 300. But it didn't start this way. As a matter of fact, what you need to know contextually is that Gideon is an Israelite, obviously. But the Israelites are not per se enslaved to the Midianites, but they are under Midianite oppression. The Midianites are far larger in number. They know the land well and what's going on as a consequence to Israel's own disobedience. For several years, the Midianites have been sacking and they have been ravaging the Israelite camp. They'll go in, they'll burn some tents down, they ransack their houses and steal their food and resources, they'll steal their livestock, their protein, they'll steal their wheat, anything that the Israelites had harvested, the Midianites knew what time of year to go in and to take what they will. And so now the Israelites are in a very precarious situation. And when we find Gideon in chapter number six, Gideon is actually trying to hide some wheat that he threshed. He's trying to hide it in a wine press. If you know anything about a wine press, it's, it's underground. And so now, instead of being down there and and squishing and squashing the grapes to produce wine. He's hiding wheat so that he can provide for his family in order that the Midianites will not get their hand on it. While doing so, after he finishes, the Bible says, and this is chapter six, that God speaks to Gideon. In fact, an angel appears to him and says, Gideon, you mighty man of valor, you are going to be the one I use to deliver the Israelites out of the hands of the Midianites. Now, here's what you need to know about Gideon. It's all in his response. Gideon literally tells God, I don't know, ever know you to be wrong, but I think you're wrong today. Because what you should know about me is I am from the weakest tribe in Israel the tribe of Manasseh. We're the weakest tribe. We can't fight. Secondly, I'm from the weakest family in the weakest tribe. 
we stay home and make biscuits. Third, I'm the weakest man from the weakest family in the weakest tribe. Three strikes, I'm out. But God says, that's exactly why I choose you. You are who is unexpected to lead. You're the one who is unexpected to deliver the people. And by virtue of me calling and choosing you for this tumultuous task, all of Israel will know that you didn't do this, but I did this. I need to remind Israel because of their disobedience. I need to remind them who I am, what I've done, what I'm capable of doing, and who should get the glory. And so now Gideon says, well, if that's the case, I need you to, if you don't mind, I need you to give me a sign. First sign is the angel tells him to bring out some food. The angel places it on the rock. He strikes the rock and the rock begins to catch on fire and it consumes the food. And Gideon says, I've never seen anything like this. So, I, okay, I'm with it. Let's get to business. Now he begins to go around and he begins to now recruit soldiers in order to fight the Midianites, but he gets scared as it comes time closer to war. He gets scared, not scared, scared. And he says, Lord, I'm gonna be honest with you. I need another sign. God says, okay, what do, you, what, what do you want me to do? He says, well, I have a fleece. Y'all know this story. He says, well, if, 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 if on the first day, if I know that the dew hits early in the morning, and so if the dew would only consume the fleece and not the grass, I'll know you're with me. I know, I know you chose me. God says, ain't no thing. Next morning, Gideon wakes up. The fleece is soaked in dew but the ground is dry. Gideon says, God, I love you for real, but I'm nervous. And so if you would be so kind, can I get one more round? I need another sign. I just want to make sure that I'm sure. I want to make sure I'm not going crazy. And God said, no nah, problem. What do you want me to do? He says, well, I want you to take the same fleece, but this time I want the fleece to remain dry. And the ground be covered in dew. God says, give me a little time. He wakes up the next morning. The fleece is completely dry. And the ground is consumed with dew. That's his all Bible. Gideon says, well, I guess I can't run from it now. It's time for this thing to go down. He recruits, the Bible lets us know, around 32,000 men who are willing to fight on behalf of Israel. Now, that's what might seem like a considerably good amount of brothers. But what we learn later in chapter number seven is that Gideon's army of 32,000 was about to go up against the Midianite army of over 150,000. So now Gideon and his army of 32,000 are outnumbered by well over 100,000 men. And so Gideon says, okay, um, I already got my sign, so I know God is with me. God said we're going to get the victory, so let's go ahead and do this. But something happens right here at verse numbers, number one. God speaks to Gideon and says, hey, Gideon, you did a good job rounding up the troops. But I want you to know you have too many men. I need you to cut the numbers down. Because if you don't, y'all going to think y'all did this yourselves. There's too many people involved for me to get the glory I deserve. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to just go to the brothers and make a declaration that anybody who is scared or afraid, there's no love lost, no judgment. Y'all go home. And the Bible says 22,000 men that said they had Gideon's back. They said, ah, well, they looked on the other side and said, if I'm going to die, I might as well die in the arms of my wife. 
It went home, the Bible says. We're in verses 1 through 3. The Bible says the Lord comes back to Gideon. He only has 10,000 men left. And the Lord says there's still too many. I know Gideon is like, what in the world is going on? There's 10,000 against over 150,000 brothers in that valley. And God says it's too many. Gideon says, what do you want me to do? He says, I want you to lead them to the brook nearby so they can quench their thirst. But I want you to observe. Some of the men are with dignity and with the manners their mama taught them. Will bend over and scoop the water with their hands and bring it to their mouths. But some of the other men who have an animalistic comple complex, they're just going to get down and start drinking the water like dirty dogs. Those are the ones I want you to release to go home. The Bible says only 300 men cup the water to their mouths, which means Gideon had to dismiss 9,700. Now there's 300 men. It reminds me of that movie, 300. Anybody ever seen that movie? 300 men versus over 150,000. And here's what God tells Gideon next. We didn't read it. He says, I want you to go down because I've already given you the victory. But if you're still afraid, I want you to take your servant and go survey the land. He takes his servant Pura. They go and they cloak themselves in disguise. They go survey what's going on in the Midianite camp. The Midianites who have now aligned themselves with the Amalekites. The Bible says that Gideon and his servant do something that a lot of us are guilty of doing in this life. They begin eavesdropping on somebody's conversation. There's a brother talking to another brother and he says, I had a dream last night that a, a, a loaf of bread rolled into the Midianite camp, struck the tent, and all of the tents fell over. It's in your Bible. You can read it when you have time. I promise it's there. And the, and the man, the servant, looks at Gideon and says, that dream is about you. We have the victory. It's time for us to go to war. And Gideon, with the courage that he now has, goes to war with the Midianites. And I'll let you know the outcome in just a moment. For the time that is ours to share, just a few more minutes, I want to teach from the lesson subject, Little Becomes Much. Sunday I preached a, a sermon, last Sunday I preached a sermon from the same text titled, Less is More. And today, tonight, I want to teach little becomes much. I still believe little becomes much in the hand of God. It reminds me of that old story the preachers would tell about two little girls who walk into, you know, old school. Uh, we from the old school, some of us. I still consider myself on the old school spectrum. Uh, and we used to have something in the neighborhood called the candy lady. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Uh, and the candy lady, uh, the candy lady, she had uh, a house, and it was just a normal house. She ain't had no business license or nothing like that. Uh, but everybody left her alone because she was the candy lady. And uh, you can go to her house. You can get pickle sausage, pickle eggs, pickles. You can get yourself some candy, of course. Uh, you can get yourself. Uh, some freeze cups. Y'all call them huckabucks or something like that down here. I don't know nothing about that. I'm from up north. We call them freeze cups. You know, that's when you take some Kool-Aid in a styrofoam cup and just put it in the freezer with a stick in it. Y'all know what I'm talking about. That's what the candy lady provided. You know, the candy lady, she'll watch your kids for a few hours. You know, that, the candy lady always looked out for everybody in the community. Or we had something called the penny candy store. I wish I had a witness right there. I know some of, our young, some of these young adults are like, I don't know what y'all talking about right now. But we used to have something called the penny candy store. With 25 cents, you can go to the penny candy store and get yourself a bag of at least 25 pieces of candy. Everything was a penny. 
Well, two little girls one day walk inside the penny candy store, and the gentleman is there. He welcomes them. He knows their parents, and he welcomes the two little girls in, and he says, you know what? I'm in a good mood today, my young sisters. What I'm going to do is, I know both of you have 25 cent apiece, so here's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to allow you to put your hand in the jar, and you can pick out as many pieces as you can with one hand. If you get more than 25 pieces, you can keep what you got. If you... Uh, if you get less than 25 pieces, I'll add to what you pulled out so that you can at least have 25 pieces. Is that a deal? They say, yeah, that's a deal. Let's go ahead and get to it. And so the first girl, she's super excited, and she puts her hand in the candy jar, and she pulls out 30 pieces of candy with her little hand. The girl was aggressive. And he counts the candy, and she had five additional pieces that she didn't have to pay for, and she was super excited. Uh, but her friend was standing next to her, and she observed what was going on. And the gentleman said, it's your turn, my young sister. And, he, and she responded to him by saying, so you're telling me if a hand goes into the jar, no matter how many uh, pieces the hand pulls out, we can keep the pieces? She, and the man says, absolutely. And here's the brilliance of the second girl. She says, well, if you got to put a hand in the jar, I would like you, sir, to put your hand in the jar and pull out the pieces. He says, I didn't even think about that, and I can't even protest that. That is absolutely brilliant. And so he puts his hand in the jar, and the gentleman pulled out 42 pieces of candy with one hand. And the first girl said, I don't like this. I, this is messed up. Uh, and he said, you can't get mad because she was thinking. She took her time and she thought about it. And the second girl, the man asked the second girl, why would you ask me to put my hand in the jar to get the pieces? He, and she responded exactly what y'all thinking. I realize that your hands are bigger than my hands. And if I put what I want in your hands, I know I can get more of what I desire. Desire. And the moral of the story is that no matter what you're going through, when you try to handle it yourself, you can come up with some solutions, but not all solutions. But if you put what you're going through in the hands of God, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, little becomes much in the hands of God. Amen. I want you to see something in our lesson tonight. Gideon, before this war, this battle, if you will, Gideon is actually dealing with an internal complex. The reason why he keeps asking God, I had to tell you the backstory, because the reason why he keeps asking God for signs is because he's not confident in himself. He tells God, I'm the weakest brother from the weakest family of the weakest tribe. Why in the world would you be talking to me about this? I'm not even a warrior. I'm no fighter. And God responds, if you read between the lines, saying, I didn't tell you you had to fight. I just told you that you would deliver. Oh, that's a word for somebody here tonight. But we have to deal with Gideon because Gideon is dealing with an inferiority complex. He lacks confidence. He lacks self-assurance. His faith in himself is low, and he even questions God. This is why he needs so many signs. Gideon could have been confident after the first sign, but he asked for a couple more which indicates that Gideon is not confident in what God has told him. As a matter of fact, even after he gets the army split from 32,000 to 300, God tells him, you can go now and get the victory, but if you're still afraid, go and survey the land. And we know Gideon is still afraid because he takes his servant and he goes and checks out the Midianite camp. Gideon is dealing with what some of us deal with. He is low in some of the intangibles. Any good, uh, any good athletic coach on any level, doesn't matter if it's adolescence, 
high school, college pros. Any good coach loves to have a great athlete, somebody who's good on both sides of the court or good on both sides of the field or proficient in, one, in whatever their pro, a position is, somebody who has an athletic build. But I'll tell you what, most coaches will tell you, I need you to understand that we do not just look at your athletic ability. We need to see something called the intangibles. Are you, do you not, uh, uh, we want to make sure you don't just play the game, but that you think the game. We want to make sure that you're a good leader in the locker room, that you lead by example. We want to make sure that you're not just a good athlete, but you're also a good student. We want to make sure that you are sensible and that you respect. As a matter of fact, coaches will go to a player's house and see how the player interacts with their parents. Dawn Staley, uh, the coach of, head coach of the South Carolina uh, Gamecocks that just won the women's NCAA title, she said that she goes to kids' houses and studies how they interact with their parents because she realized that if they disrespect their parents, they'll disrespect me. It's called the intangibles. I need you to understand something, child of God, that we live in a world that is so consumed with the desire for tangible things. Money. We all want more money. Nice car, nice house, vacations, vacation home, uh, uh, possessions, electronics, wardrobe, shoes, my sisters. Praise the Lord. Some of you brothers, too, got a good collection. In. We get so infatuated with the tangible things. And so a lot of our spirituality, particularly the spirituality of a large number of people who call themselves followers of Christ or disciples of God, their, their spirituality or their religiosity is based on I'm spiritual because I need something from God. I'm spiritual because I want something from God. The question is, what exactly do you want? Do you want God to give you stuff? Or do you want God to give you an abundant life? Because living abundantly is not isolated to having a lot of stuff. You can have a lot of stuff and be miserable. There's people with a lot of money and they depressed. There's people with millions in their account, but they laying in a hospital bed and doctors can't figure out what's wrong with them. I'm here to let you know that no matter what your social status is, no matter how much is in your 401k or IRA, no matter how much you have in the bank account, no matter how many cars you have, you can only drive one at a time. No matter how many rooms are in your house, no matter where your house is located, what your zip code is, I'm here to let you know that you will go through something in this life that only God can get you out of. Can I get a witness here, somebody? And so now the shift has to be from, I know God can give me this tangible, but what does this mean if I don't have the intangibles? I'm talking about love, real love, pure love, agape love, unconditional. I'm talking about peace. Hello, sir. Who just said that? Somebody just said peace. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Peace. Peace. Peace is more valuable than any amount of money you have in your bank account right now. You can have a whole lot of money, but if you don't have peace of mind, you will lose your mind. You can have a million dollars and be in the insane asylum. I'm trying to really help deliver somebody today. Intangibles, love, peace, joy. I'm talking about joy, not happiness. I'm talking about joy. Happiness is a temporary state of condition. I'm trying to, oh, I wish I had real time tonight. Happiness is a temporary state of condition. What do you mean, Howard? What I'm saying is happiness has an expiration date. You're happy for a specific amount of time. You're happy until you're no longer happy. The reality of the matter is things can make us happy, but only for a while. But joy is a state of being. <laughs> what does that mean? That means uh, I can wake up and if I stump my toe, I might not be happy. But if I stump my toe and I'm in relationship with God, I'm going to say, ouch, but I'm going to still have joy. See, 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 if I'm not 
cultivating my growth in my, in my relationship, when I stump my toe, it'll mess up my whole day. I stump my toe at 6.30. Now at 6.30 at night, I still have an attitude. It threw your whole day off. But when you have joy, you know that the, wor the, the world can't. Come on, y'all been in church long enough. The world can't give it what? The world. I stumped my toe, but I still remember God woke me up this morning. Let me put let me little, put a little ice pack on it for a few minutes. Let me go ahead and put a little icy hot on my toe. And I'm going to keep it moving because I'm not going to let that distract me or deter me from remembering how good God has been for me. I stumped my toe at 630, but I'm shouting. I'm, I stumped my toe at 630 a.m., but I'm shouting at 630 p.m. Intangibles, joy, peace, love, confidence. These are things that have to be cultivated. You want to know why? Here's my first, you'll see it right there. Listen, uh, 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 here's the, the first main point in the outline. It's right there. I'm, t I'm already teaching it. The intangible is more valuable than the tangible. It's way more valuable. Love, peace, joy, confidence, patience. Patience is an intangible. Here's how we know it's more valuable than tangible. It's more valuable than your car. It's more valuable than what's in your account. It's more valuable than your house. I know you got some good equity building up, but I'm letting you know the intangibles are more valuable. Here's how we know. And it's very simple. The intangibles are more valuable than the tangibles. Watch this, because you can't purchase them. I, I, let me tell you something. If I could go to Target and buy peace, I'd be in Target every day. Y'all not talking back to me in here tonight? If I could go and buy joy from Walmart, I'd have a Walmart credit card, Deke, and I would be stockpiling joy every day, every season, so I never run out. If, let me tell y'all something, if you could buy patience, a lot of us would be in debt. <laughs> I got to go get me some more patience. I got to uh, go ahead and put it on the MasterCard because I just can't deal with this right now. It can't be bought. It can't be purchased. You can go buy a car. You can go buy a house. The tangible things. But real love, pure love, it can't be bought. You can't buy pure love. Now, now, now listen. You can, you can do some things, you know, with, with, with you, can, you can go buy a nice bracelet for your wife. You can go buy some flowers, and it will give her happiness. But real love, watch this, real love, it exists and lasts in any season, which means if we're up, we're still in love. If we're down, we're still in love. When it's good, we in love. When it's bad, we in love. I told you at that altar, if you had money, I love you a lot. If you don't have money, I still love you. <laughs> I wish somebody keep it real in here. I love you a lot when you got it. But if you don't got it, I ain't going to leave you, baby. I ain't going to leave you. Because watch this. Because you know what. Here it is. Here's the real shout. Because when you have a real relationship with God, you can get lose and not be not be dismayed because you know you can go get it again. The intangible is more valuable than the tangible. Gideon needs courage. He needs a boost in his own morale in order to lead these men. So what happens? God approaches him and says, you have 32,000. That's impressive, but it's too many. Read, let's, let's, let's read real quick. Go to verse 2, chapter 7. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people said, to, uh, who are, the people are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn, depart at once from Mount Gilead, and 22,000 of the people return, and 10,000 remain. What we realize is that after a reprieve by the brook, only 300 remained out of 32,000. Let me tell you something. 
Gideon is struggling with his confidence. But look what God does. He doesn't add to the army. He subtracts from the army. Now, let me tell you something. You're either going to take that two ways. You're either going to say, God, you are crazy. Or you're going to say, God, you are really up to something. And I, I'm going to choose to believe you. You have to make a choice. I want you to know that little becomes much in the hands of God. And sometimes I want you to understand something. That when you go through a season, when you go through a time period, when you go through a situation, when it feels like you're in lack, when it feels like you're less than, I want you to understand that when you are less than, I'm already in my, in my, my beep claws, when you are less than, that's when God can really be more than. God loves to prove God's self in dismal, destitute kind of situations. Because what happens is when God manifests, it gives you the indication that this could not have happened unless it were for God on my side. It boosts your faith and your confidence in God. Sometimes your storm isn't to punish you. Sometimes your rainy season isn't about you paying consequences. Sometimes God says, I need you to go through this. Because I'm actually strengthening you for the next season of your life. And when you come out of this, you are going to be stronger and you're going to learn things about yourself and your faith that you didn't even know you possessed. It's not about punishing you. It's about elevating your faith. It's about elevating your confidence. Confidence in God and confidence in self. And if you're going to have confidence in God, sub subsequently, you ought to have ultimate confidence in yourself because the word says, greater is he that is, ah, I wish I had, greater is he that is in me. If he is in me and I'm confident in him, that means I'm confident in myself. I'm going to walk on faith. It is what it is. I know what they said. It don't look good for you. I know it don't look good. It don't look good to me either, but it looks good to God. I'm going to go with it. I wish I had a witness here, somebody. I said the same thing. It don't look great, but I'm going to keep going. It's a risk. I know it's a risk. That is why I'm stepping out on faith. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things a clause, you see it in the A clause. We need what we cannot see more than what we can see. We need what we cannot see more than what we can see. I, 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 it starts with the Spirit of God. I need God in my life more than anything, in the, anything else. The reason why is because it's God who gave and gives me life. There is no life without God, and there is no abundant life without God. Therefore, I need God in my life first and foremost. I can't see God, but I can see the work of God. Ooh! And so I know, I know what you're saying. We don't have Jesus walking around like Peter, James, and John did, but you have the evidence of a brilliant God. You have the evidence of a cosmic creator. All you have to do when you wake up in the morning at sunrise, just step outside the door for a little while and listen to the birds chirp. And be reminded that Jesus says, don't you remember the birds in the air that we created? They don't know where they're going to get their next meal from, but it doesn't stop them from singing in the morning because they know their creator is going to take care of them. And if the birds of the air know this, then what more will God do for you? You can look into the sky and see the majesty of God's creation. You can look on your lawn and see the growth that God instituted. All you have to do is look around. I might not see God, but I can see the work of God. And if you can't get inspiration from any of those things, go to your nearest restroom and look in the mirror. I wish I had a witness tonight. Because when you look at the, when you look in the mirror, you're looking at a miracle. 
Can I get a witness from somebody here? You're looking at a miracle when you look in the mirror. Child of God, the intangible is more, than the, uh, more valuable than the tangible. We need what we cannot see more than what we can see. Gideon saw 32,000. God said, I need you to see me. Because if you see me, you're going to have the confidence to walk into this battle no matter how many people are walking with you. I need you to send some people away. The ones that are afraid, send them away. Isn't it interesting that 22,000 people straight up bounced on this brother? They said, peace out. We love you, Gideon. You're a good guy. But not this time. 22,000 left. He's only left with 10,000. Then God says, I want to send some brothers to the water, and I want to test them. And so, uh, I, I, uh, and so the ones that lap like dogs, send them home too. Because if they get down and lap like dogs in the river, in the, in the brook, that means they're not watching their surroundings. I wish, ooh, I'm trying to help somebody. I'm trying to paint a picture. I don't have a lot of time left. If they're lapping like dogs, see, the ones that cup the water to their mouth, they can drink and watch. Bible says, watch as well as pray. Okay, y'all, y'all. If they're lapping like dogs, they're not doing too much watching. Send them home. I'm going to work with the 300 you have left. I know you're going up against 100, over 150,000, but we can work with the 300. Child of God, when facing less than, you have to trust God. You have to trust the God of more than. When you're facing less than, you have to trust the God of more than. And less than is not just about, and y'all know I really emphasize this because I really want it to register in the minds of the people of God. It's not just about your economic status. It's not about trying to get out of debt. It's not about your credit score. That's easy for God. What I'm telling you is we can be less than in many areas of our lives. I can be less than in my health. I can be less than in my decision making. My marriage can be in a less than condition. My relationship with my child can be in a less than state. I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to be real with somebody. I'm in a less than situation on my job. I want to get up out of there in as less time as possible. Amen, church. You're not fulfilled on your job. There's something you want to do. There's something creative. You might feel less than in your confidence like Gideon. Something that you see all the time and you know you can do it. But something fear is more than because your courage is less than. Peace can be less than in your life. You sleep 10 hours and wake up dirt tired. Can't seem to get any peace. No, it, it, you're taking your vitamins. That's all good. Your mind is in chaos. You can't sleep because your mind is still moving. You sleep, but you're not getting rest. Less than. Less than can mean a, a vicissitude of things for many different individuals. But I'll tell you what, no matter what you're lacking or less than in, if you're, f if you never, watch this, we can even be less than in faith. Can we talk spirit for a minute? Can we, and can we be honest today? Okay. Because if y'all going to be honest, like I'm being honest right now, sometimes your faith can be as much as you go to church, as much as you still believe God, your faith can take a hit. Because if life really knocks the life out of you the way that it can every now and then, and here's the catch, I'm being faithful, I'm coming to church, I don't even really have it, but I'm paying my little tithe and I'm giving on top of that, I'm taking care of I'm loving my wife like myself. My wife, I'm loving my husband like Christ loved the church. I'm doing all of these things. I'm, doing, I'm trying to do what I'm supposed to do. And now I'm going through something and I'm wondering where God is. If we're going to be vulnerable in here today, if you anything like me, sometimes you get an attitude with God too. Okay, y'all, 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 y'all. We don't want, we, can we be, can we, can we be, can we talk? We get angry with God sometimes. That's why I really love God. I mean, that's why I really, really love God. Because when sometimes you get angry at somebody that you're in relationship with, 
they stop talking to you for a few months. I'm glad God ain't like us. We can get angry with God. Tell God we angry. And God says, I love you, my child. <laughs> Tell me all about it. Express your anger. Isn't it amazing that God, no matter what condition and no matter what we're feeling, God always welcomes conversation from us. And don't act like, come on here, somebody. Don't act like you don't get petty with God sometime. Okay, y'all, 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 y'all. Yo, yo, look, something about digging home, I ain't even going to sit here and lie to you. Every now and then, I'll go through something, and I'm just like, God, what in the world is going on? And I know, listen, I get a little petty with God sometimes. I wake up, it, 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 it's 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, I ain't pray, and I know I ain't pray. You know, you ain't, you ain't going to hear from me today. Oh, y'all, don't, don't, don't act like, don't, don't, oh. Yeah, 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 I've been praying all this time. You ain't heard me all week, so why pray now? And then, you know, by the evening time, you could, well, Lord, you know, you know, you, you know, I was angry. Uh, you know, I guess I'm sorry. You know, what do you want me to do? Yeah, yeah, you know, you, can, you, know, you have an attitude with God. You, you know, come on, God know when we have an attitude. If we know when each other has an attitude, you know, God knows when we have an attitude. God knows our heart better than anybody else. Because you know when the person you love has an attitude, even when they say they're not mad. Well, uh, where are my brothers at in here? Y'all not talking back to me? You just stomping around the house. What's wrong, baby? Nothing. Ain't nothing wrong. You need me to do anything? I don't need nothing from you. Uh, what's that all about? Come on, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. They say nothing, but what they do? They got, I guess I'm going to go ahead and cook you this little raggedy meal. You know I don't feel it. You could have picked up some takeout on your way home. You know I wasn't feeling good. And then we get to banging pots and pans, slamming cupboards and microwaves. Uh, baby, what's going on? Ain't nothing going on. Go ahead and watch the game. <laughs> Woo! Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I've been there. I've been there. I've been on both ends. Amen, church. Amen, church. And it happens sometimes even in our relationship with God. And let me tell you something. When faith begins to waver and you're in a less than condition, take the rest of the faith that you have left and say, God, I know you have not answered the way in the time that I wanted you to answer. But I'm going to take what faith I have left and I'm going to believe and I'm going to praise you. I'm going to give you the glory. I don't feel like it. I'm tired. I got a headache. I'm frustrated. But I'm going to give you the glory right now. And what you'll discover that in your less than condition, God will show up as more than. And he won't just answer your prayer. He going to give you something you ain't even asked for. Can I get a witness from somebody in here tonight? Let me tell you just a quick story because I don't have a lot of time left. I probably won't even get to my second move. I want you to, I'm going to give you an assignment. I want you to really read this passage. I want you to read, I want you to read from six all the way to the end of seven. Um, and it's going to bless your life. Matter of fact, read through eight. Because that is the entire ministry of Gideon. Six through eight. Judges chapter six through eight. Six, seven, and eight. Re yes, ma'am. Six, seven, and eight. Now listen, let me give you the end of the story. The Bible lets us know that what happens is Gideon, you're going to read this in your study time. But Gideon, now his confidence is boosted because he knows, listen, God know we can't win with 300. So that must mean God is going to do something miraculous. He goes down after he surveys the Midianites. He goes back to the 300. He splits them into groups of 100. So there's, there's a troop of 100. There's three troops of 100. He places them strategically all around the Midianite army while they're asleep. The Bible says that he is instructed to take glass jars and trumpets, no weapons, glass jars and trumpet. He gives every soldier a glass jar and a trumpet. And he says, when we get in position, I want y'all to do what I'm going to do. They say, what you gonna do? 
they said he says I'm going to praise God and blow my trumpet they get in position Gideon breaks his glass the rest of the company follows suit they blow their horns their trumpets and they're praising God check out what happens the Bible says that the Midianites wake up from their slumber and they're so confused God confuses them so much that they don't know where the noise is coming from so they begin to kill one another Gideon and his 300 never had to pick up a sword all they had to do was give God praise because what you need to understand is that even when you're in your less than condition if you can muster up a praise unto God what it does is it confuses the enemy I wish I had a witness in here Ooh. I should have saved this for a Sunday, Deacon Homer. It confuses the enemy. What happens is the enemy knows what kind of attack it launched on your marriage, what kind of attack it launched on your child, what kind of attack it launched on your finances. But if you learn how to give God praise, even in the midst of frustration and a less than season, what happens is the enemy gets confused. How is she still shouting and she's going through all of that? How is he still worshiping? And I know what he's going through. That's because I have learned that trouble don't last. I got excited. Let me calm down. I get excited over this word. Their praise confused the enemy. And they wiped out one another. So much so that a few thousand that were left went on the run. And Gideon and his 300 chased them down. Let me tell you what else happened. Gideon in what the athletic world was called a jag, meaning just another guy. It's just another guy. Ordinary fellow. Nobody really knew Gideon. He didn't have any kind of prominence. God said, I choose you. You're from a small town. You're from a weak tribe. You're a weak bro brother. You don't even want to fight nobody. But I'm going to choose you. When he got chosen, he was nobody. He was so not disrespected, but non-respected that 22,000 people walked away from him and left him to fight with 10,000. By the end of the war, the same people came back to Gideon and asked him to be king. And watch what he does. He turned it down. Because when you know you're anointed and when you know you're chosen by God, titles don't even move you. You just do the work because it's what God called you to do. Whether you call me deacon or not, whether you call me usher, whether you call me pastor or bishop, it really doesn't move me at all. You can call me JC and I'll be just fine because I am comfortable in the anointing that God gave me. We'd be so further along if we weren't caught up on titles. And the church is the only place historically that we've handed out titles like candy to appease people's feelings. They ain't going to be here in this church. We try and do something different here. We don't want to have a title to work. We do the work whether we have a title or not. Peter ain't had no the title. They ain't call him Bishop Peter. They call him Peter. I'm wrapping up my lesson tonight. I ain't even get to my second main point. That's how good this lesson really is. It's so rich. I have so much more to say, but I'm closing on this. Those of you who are online, we're about to log off in the next 90 seconds, but I got to give you this story first. I want to give you an example of how God will move in a less than moment. I don't even usually share things like this. But last weekend, around Thursday, leading into the weekend, 
Um, y'all know we have in this seat in, in, in this generation. I know some of y'all still old school and y'all y'all write uh, 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 what are those things money orders and stuff like that to pay bills. We have something called automated pay, amen. Uh, and so what happens is uh, the whoever the company is, they just tap you. They just tap your account and the money comes right out. Now what happened was, uh, we, you know how we you know how we do. What had happened was, uh, uh, I, I, I was I was uh, I'm responsible uh, for uh, the gas bill in my home. Now uh, what I didn't realize was that during the winter months, the gas bill goes up significantly if you don't have uh, a static bill. And I didn't have the time. Now, I want to let y'all know, I did call the gas company, and I said, I need y'all to set my bill from now on. That's another story for another day. But let me tell you what happened. My gas bill hit, and I didn't know it was going to be that high, like $600 for gas. I said, devil is a, a liar. Okay. Now, the week before, I talked to the lady, uh, I told her, and she said, I'm just going to let you know that it's not, it's not going to be pretty. I don't know exactly how much, but it ain't going to be pretty. I was trying to prepare myself, but I ain't preparing myself for 600 Money came out, right? Now, let me give you the good news. I was tripping because I wanted to do something for my wife, and I had put a little money aside. I said, we just want to go do something nice for the weekend. And what happened was, because that hit, I could have still went, but I'd have been irresponsible in other areas. So I said, we're going to have to sacrifice that this weekend. It's, it's all good. Let's just do something at the house. Netflix and chill, baby. Netflix and chill. And so, and so, praise God. Amen. You can do that when you're married. Praise God. Uh, and so, and so, um, and so I, I didn't trip. But here's what happened, and I'm letting y'all go. I was kind of bummed out because I, 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 I wanted to do something, but that money came out, and I didn't expect it to be that much. And so I was kind of bummed out, but I didn't trip. And you know what? Something came over me. And I say, you know what? I'm not even worried about this. Not only that, because, I mean, first of all, I had the resources to take care of my obligations. That's the first shout. But secondly, something came over me, and here's what I did. I said, you know what? When I get to church, I never say things like this. I said, when I get to church on Sunday, somebody's going to give me $100. They're not going to give it to me to put in the bucket. They're going to sow it into my life. They're just going to come give me $100. You know how we do that as church folks sometimes. We like to take care of our preacher. Put a little 20 little 50 little $100 in their hand every now and then. Uh, I, said, I said, somebody's going to hand me a $100 bill for me. And I said a $100 bill. I never say things like that. I'm always grateful when people do it. I'm always humbled by it because I don't ask for it. But I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for it. But I said that out loud to myself. You know what? I wasn't even guilty by it. I, it didn't phase me. I kept moving with my day. Let me tell you what happened. Sunday, that was Saturday. Sunday comes around. Sunday morning. I wasn't even thinking about it. I was in my vanity preparing. I was putting on my robe. I was preparing. I always go over my sermon notes. I make little adjustments. I kind of get in my little zone. Uh, and somebody knocked on the door. Now, I thought it was my director of ministries. He usually comes in, checks in, makes sure everything is okay. It wasn't him. I thought it was one of my armor bearers, Linwood Evans. He knocks, makes sure I'm good, let me, lets me know he's outside. Uh, it wasn't him. It was one of the brothers of the church. His name is Brother Cleveland Thomas. He never comes to my vanity, ever. He's never been in my vanity before. In five years of pastoring, he knocked on the door. I said, come on in. I said, Cleve, what you doing here, man? You all right? You good? You need prayer? He said, no. He said, I just came to talk for a minute. I said, okay, cool. He walked up to me and put a $100 bill in my hand. He said, Pastor, that's just for you. He said, I just wanted to, you know, I just felt led to do that for you. That's all. And, um, you know, go ahead and enjoy yourself. You and your wife go out, get something to eat. He said, and then um, he said, you know, and then he start, then he told me about some things that he wanted me to pray for he and his wife for. I said, no problem. And he walked out. He, he's never even been in my vanity. Not only that, but check this. I thought it would happen after service. But you know, you preach hard, people get moved sometimes. I got to give Rev a little something. Oh, he hit it today. So I said, it probably happened after service, you know, but I just said it out loud. Didn't think anything of it, woman of God. Before church even started, he walked right into my vanity and didn't just put a $100 bill, exactly what I said in my hand. When you learn how to trust God in less than seasons or less than situations, and still know how to speak things over your life, even in the midst of lack, 
you will be astonished at how quickly God will respond to what you said. Because what happens is this, and I'm done. What happens is when you operate in that kind of level of faith and trust in God, even though you're in a less than season, when you muster up your, your faith and you apply it to your life, you won't have to chase what you're praying for. What you're praying for will come right to you. Somebody give God praise in this place tonight. Everybody's standing. We have to go. I'm over my time. I never share things like that, but I had to share that tonight. The reason why is because it was a quick turnaround of what I know God is capable of doing. I didn't call anybody and, you know, put a little word on. I didn't play a guilt trip on anybody. Nobody even knew. I just spoke it over my life by the authority of God. And when I thought that I was going to have to preach hard and somebody would sow it, Lord said, you ain't even got to step in the church yet. I'm going to bring it right to you. That's what faith will do in your life. The intangible things are way more valuable. So do not fret your season of rain. New Edition said, can you stand the rain? That's a statement, y'all. Y'all know y'all still got that song in your playlist. Don't act like you don't know. Come on now. God, we thank you for this word tonight. I bless you. You're so worthy. Those of us who are in person, those of us who are even joining online, we want you to know that we're grateful tonight. In all things, the Bible says give thanks. And so here is our obligation to thank you no matter what I'm going through. If we can be vulnerable with you tonight, Lord, we're all dealing with something. Some of us are worried about a situation in our lives. Some of us are worried about a child that you gave us. Some of us are experiencing health challenges that we're trying to work our way through. Some of us are experiencing some financial struggles. Some of us are dealing with things in our occupation. Some of us are dealing with a lack of courage to just step out and to do what we really feel passionate about. Some of us are dealing with stress and anxiety. And there's so many other things that I can name, but there's one thing I know for sure that you can remedy all of those things. You are the cosmic problem solver. No matter what kind of problem we possess, you have the power to solve it. And so tonight, God, we want you to know that the little that I have, I turn it over to you. The little strength I have, I give it to you. The little joy I have, I give it to you. The little faith that I have left, I turn it over to you because I know little becomes much in the hands of God. Lord, you're able to turn things around in a very strategic way that reminds us only God could do this for me. So my prayer tonight is that's exactly what you decide to do. In the words of that leper in the Gospel of Mark, Gospel of John, excuse me, who says, Lord, I know you're able, but I ask that you would be willing we already know what you're able to do, God. And so our prayer tonight is that you would be willing, willing to send peace to that stress, willing to send healing to that sickness, willing to send a new season to that job and occupational issue, willing to send overflow to the financial lack willing to send joy to an unhappy individual, willing to revive the fire in that marriage that is on life support. God, you can do it. You can turn it around, and we believe you for it tonight. Little becomes much in your hands, O oh God. And what I'll vow to do, my responsibility, is to ensure, Lord, that 
I concentrate on the intangibles of this life. The tangible things will come and go. The happiness that they provide wear off after a while. But the joy that you give is everlasting, intangible. The love that you provide is everlasting. The peace that you give surpasses all understanding, intangible. Those are the things that if I invest, I know that they will manifest in my life. And when I do that, all of the material things will come. Thank you for this word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God praise in this place tonight.